Our Lord and Savior has led us. He has redeemed us. He has guided us. And given us strength to His holy habitation. Amen. Let me start out with a little introduction this morning. And see if we can understand what's going on here. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He established the testimony in Jacob and pointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make it known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Now, before you think I'm some great orator, I am not. That is from Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. And I say that because we're going to look at parables and stories. And we're going to learn from them. And we're going to share them with our children. So that we can share them with our children and their children. God is sharing to you, his children, this morning. These stories. So that we might be drawn closer to him. If you'll turn in your Bibles now to Exodus chapter 16. And stand with me for the reading of God's word here. We'll start with verse 1 through 7, chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. It says, Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregations and the sons of Israel came into the wilderness of Zin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, What that we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the people shall go out. Actually, let me back up. And the Lord said to me, Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gathered daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. What are we? She grumbled against us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me see it. Last week when we were talking, they'd only been three days post the Red Sea. And they were complaining and grumbling about water. Remember, they grumbled, they complained. Their attitude was wrong to Moses. And what did Moses do? Moses went before the Lord, and the Lord told him what to do. Expressed to them to place the tree in the water. Now that tree in and of itself had no magical properties or anything, but it sweetened the waters. Quite a miracle when you're in the desert. And it says here they departed, and after that they left and came to the land of Elam, where they we talked about they were seven springs of water not pools of water springs of water continued refreshing waters and we talked about how there were 70 palm trees there and we talked about how bad times and good times are not permanent we come and we go we come and we go through them and so here it is it says now they have left and they went into the wilderness, it's pronounced Zin, but you can say sin. Now this is not sin like you and I understand sin, but I do find it ironic. 
went into the wilderness of sin. Oh my, don't we go there often? They went into the wilderness of sin just a month, basically, the second month of their departure from the land of Egypt. Two months in, and now we're grumbling again. The whole, this is the whole congregation. It wasn't just a few of them. It says the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. Who did they grumble against? They grumbled against Moses. And it's not Moses' fault. But that's who they grumbled against. Did they learn? Remember, God says, I'm test you to see what you learn. Did they learn? Did they learn to go to the Lord instead of to Moses? No. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron, it says, in the wilderness. They didn't learn from the latter time, the before time, while they were in Mara. Verse 3 says that the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died in the Lord's hands in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. Did they really eat pots of meat and bread that was full till they were full? No. They had some serious false memories. Right? They were slaves. They weren't given pots of meat and bread till they were full. They were barely given anything to eat. They had to work all day. They had to get to the point where they had to gather their own straw and mud to mix the bricks. And their quota was doubled. But yet, here they go, oh, when we were back there, oh, things were so much better. You know, something like that Sue mentioned, the church is moving forward. It would be easy for you all to sit here and go, oh, brother, before we started moving forward, things were much better. We were happy. We weren't being attacked. We weren't being hurt. We were okay, right? I mean, that's, that's really what's going on here. And so, when we sat by, so they were having their selective memories. I want you to notice something this time, though, in verse 4. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Guess what? Moses didn't even get time to go before God this time. God started, he initiated this conversation. And he tells Moses, he says, Behold, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you and the people. And he tells them, In the mornings, you're going to go out and you're going to gather a day's portion every day. Why? And I may test them. Again, God's like, Are you going to learn something here? He's going to test them whether or not, listen, it says, whether or not they will walk in my instructions. So oftentimes we try not to walk in his instructions and we try to walk in our own strengths, do we not? And this is what he says, every day you'll go out and you'll pick your portion for the day. And on the sixth day, they prepare what they bring in. It will be twice as much as they gather daily. And it goes on. And Moses and them go and repeat what God has told them. And verse 7 it says, In the morning, this is Moses speaking to the people, and you will see the glory of the Lord. How many times have we received blessings and we don't even think about them as being the glory of the Lord? He doesn't have to give us a thing. Nothing. And yet he so graciously gives it and provides it. And it says, you will see the glory of the Lord. Why? Because God says, hey, you're grumbling against me. You're sinning against me. He left Moses and Aaron out of the equation this time. And so he provides, he rains the bread upon them. And he provides meat as we go further in the chapter. Because they said they didn't have any meat to eat. And God provides all the quail they can handle. I mean, there's so many of them, they can just swat them out of the air. Right? So that why? So they could see the glory of the Lord. In verse 10, it says, And it came about, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. 
Folks, when we are in a storm, when we are looking into the wilderness, when we're looking into darkness, we need to look for the glory of the Lord. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And then it says in verse 14, look at this. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake like thing as fine as a frost on the ground. Something that they had not seen before. Now I want you to notice something. Last time we talked about God gave us a new name of who He is. He gave us Jehovah Rapha. I'm your healer. Today, in this passage, He gives us another name for Himself here by providing for them. He is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is my provider. And behold, on the surface, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. It says, when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? What is it? They've never seen this before. What is it? That's what the word manna literally means. What is it? God's provision here, this manna, what is it? And he gave it to them. For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, listen, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. God gave it to them to eat. And then it says, as we move on, Verse 16, God gives them the instructions what to do. He tells them that every man is to gather as much as he should eat, an omer of peace according to the number of persons in each house of the tent. And sons of the Israel did so, but, what does it say? Some gathered much and some gathered little. God says, take what you need. No more, no less. And yet we had people who were greedy, tried to hoard it. We had some, for whatever reason, didn't even get what they thought was should have been enough. The Lord said they didn't take it very much. And then it says, when they measured it, those who had, got, had gathered much had no excess. And those who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Folks, God provides you just what you need for the moment or for the day. No more, no less. And every morning, you're to get up and you're to go and find the provisions that God's going to give you for the day. It says God provides you, again, Jehovah, Jireh. But they had failed to test already, right off the bat. He says, just take what you need. And some of them are like, thank you, Lord, you gave us food, but I don't know, I don't trust you to bring me enough for tomorrow. So I'm going to gather a little extra. Right? And then it says, let no man leave any of it till the morning. In other words, they were to use it up. They were to eat it all. Again, what does it say in verse 20? But they did not listen to Moses. Some had left part of it till the morning. And look what happened. It says it bred worms and it became foul. And Moses was angry with them. So it says they gathered it morning by morning. Every man as much as she should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Again, they failed. Like us. They failed to learn that God would provide their needs for them every day. And then it says, now on, on verse 22, it says, Now on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said to them, This is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is the Sabbath observed, a holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until the morning. I thought he told them not to keep it in the morning. 
Here they're gathering enough for the Sabbath day. Double their portion. So they put it aside in the morning as Moses had ordered. They were obedient this time. And it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. Moses told him, eat today, for today is the Sabbath of the Lord. Today you will not find any of it in the field. I want you to notice something. The idea of the Sabbath was given to the people of Israel, given to you and I, way before the Ten Commandments were ever given. The principle was given here in the Exodus early on. God is beginning to show them before he sets the law up. Verse 31 says, The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and it tasted, its taste was like waters with honey. And then God tells them to do something else. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations that it may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness. That I fed you in the wilderness. He's telling them, I'm going to bring you through. Right? He's going to bring them through because he says, you're going to keep this for generations or when I bring you through. And it says that, um, that I fed you in the wilderness and I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Where was this omer to be placed later on? It was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. It's one of the three items. Where's my kids? What's the other two items? Anybody, any kids know what the other two items were in the Ark of the Covenant? All right, big kids. Anybody have any idea what was in the Ark besides the bread? Ten Commandments. What? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, and what else? Aaron's rod, and what was he doing? Budding. Budding, perpetual budding. Very good. All right, kids, did you learn something there? Yes? Good. We don't want to leave you out of today's messages, okay? Good. And it says, As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The anticipation of the commandments yet to come. <clears throat> And it says the sons of Israel, 35 here. It says the sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came into the inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border on the land of Canaan. Now I want to go back. Imagine, that's what you ate every day for 40 years. Manna and quail. Manna and quail. How many ways can you cook manna? For 40 years. I'm sure they boiled They said they boiled it and baked it. Did they fry it? That would have been better because they would have been southern. <laughs> right? They could have barbecued it. They'd have been Texan. Right? I mean, they had to cook this six, like, a, no pun intended, but six ways to Sunday, wouldn't they? They had to get creative with it. I want us to go now. I want to talk again back in verse, or in, uh, uh, Psalms um, 78 that I read from you in the beginning. There are 72 verses in that psalm and almost every last one of those verses is a retelling of Israel when they left Egypt and their disobedience to God over and over and over again. Now, if you want to turn with me to Psalm 78, I will not read all 72 verses for this morning. <laughs> Because Donna will give me an evil look, I'm sure. But I am going to read a few. Starting in verse 8. Let's read a little bit. Psalm 78. Now we've already talked about how God has given us this so for our benefits. And he says, And be not like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirits was not faithful to God. I could just leave that right there and go, that's what you're not supposed to do. God gives us a command. Don't be like that rebellious generation. It says that the sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with the bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. Again, here we go. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his laws. They forgot his deeds. Count your blessings, people. Do not forget his deeds. And his miracles that he had shown them. The greatest miracle of human history, the 
the parting of the Red Sea. But somehow they forgot that it seemed to have happened. And yet they use that over and over again throughout their history. Right? Sometimes I'll close an email that says, Remember, the Red Sea parted, the sun stood still, and the accent did float. So some of you may not get all that, but but God did some miraculous things. He made the sea part, and he made the sun stand still for a day. And then when Elijah the man dropped the axe head, he said, just stick a stick in the water, and up came the axe head, an iron axe head, and floated. God can do the miraculous. So don't ever forget that. He says that he brought wonders before their fathers in the land of Egypt and in the field of Zone. Think about that. The ten plagues that went on before their very eyes. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the water stand up like a heap. And he led them with a cloud by day and by night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them abundant drink like the ocean's depth. He brought forth streams also from the rocks and caused water to run down the rivers. Yet still continue, what? Listen, to sin against him. Oh, how hard-hearted we are. To rebel against the Most High in the desert. To rebel against the Most High in the desert. Remember, they grumbled. Their heart was wrong. And God even says so in verse 18. And in their hearts they put God to the test. Put God to the test after all that he had done by asking for food according to their desire, not their needs, but their desire. Then they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. My goodness, he did it over and over and over again. Can he prepare a table in the wilderness? And behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams were overflowing. Then what did they ask for? Hey, you gave us water. Can you give us bread, Lord? And he will provide meat, or will he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard and was filled, or was full of wrath. Do you blame God? A fire was kindled against Jacob, and the anger almost uh, also mounted against Israel. Because they did not believe, they did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down manna upon them. In spite of their evil, in spite of their wickedness, God still provided what they needed. Absolutely in abundance, really, because it says it rained down. Listen to what he says. And he gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels. He sent food in abundance. He sent them the bread of angels. They feasted on it for 40 years. They feasted on the bread of angels for 40 years. Oh, that you and I would desire the bread of angels. Desire to be filled by God himself. You see, this bread of angels may have been called that because they may have prepared it. It may have been called the bread of angels because they delivered it. It may have been called the bread of angels because they feasted on it. All this is conjecture, but I want you to notice there are certainties about the manna given here. The Bible tells us this delicacy tasted like honey. It had to be perfect. It was perfectly balanced. Sweet, nutritious, fulfilling, why? Well, they had to eat it for 40 years. God didn't send them snicker bars and put it around the campground. He gave them exactly what they needed. Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, says that Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength abated. God provided for him for 120, 40 years, but he lived to be 120 years. And he was as strong according to God as the day he entered all this. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's lived to be 120. But I'm sure they were probably pretty weak and their eyes were weak, don't you think? So it was highly nutritious. But it was miraculously supplied. 
Listen to this. According to today's calculation, Israel gathered 9 million pounds of manna daily. 9 million pounds. That's a lot of bread on the ground. It says he gave them exactly what they needed. That 900 million pounds, that translates out to 300 trained boxcars to feed them daily. And if that was not enough, God doubled it on Friday for them, right? So they wouldn't have to labor on Saturday. What an awesome God we serve. And yet, we're just like the Israels. We fail to make God, to take God as His word that He will provide for us. Or we grumble up against God because we're going through something. And we're disobedient. We grumble. We complain. I want you to look at something now. Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Joshua chapter 5, please. Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 and 12. Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. It says, While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. This next verse, listen. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during the year, that year. Folks, God provided everything they needed till they got to Gilgal. Gilgal was in the promised land that God said, I'm going to give to you. And what does it say? <coughs> They ate from the promised land. And God says, okay, you're there. Now you need to stop. I'm not going to provide the manna for you anymore. Why? This generation that will come through to get to the promised land, remember the entire other gen the older generation had died out. Right? So this group of people, this is all they've ever known. They get up in the morning, they open up the door, there's an Uber delivery right there of manna. Right? They go out the door in the evening, they look up, here comes a bird in the hand. Right? That's all they ever knew. For 40, you know, 40 years, that's all they knew. They weren't agricultural. They just thought it was normal to wake up like that every morning, just step outside, thank you, and go about the business, right? They experienced the greatest protracted miracle in history. Can you imagine the shock on their face that day after the Passover that they ate some of the produce from the land that God had promised them and they walked out and opened up their door and there wasn't a thing there for them to eat. Isn't that amazing? Must have been shocking, right? I can only imagine what they're doing. But listen, God never does anything without a perfect purpose for it. You see, while they were in the barren, unfertile desert, God provided for their needs. But when they were in the promised land, remember, Canaan was not a desert wasteland. It was a fertile land. God said it was a land of milk and honey. Israel now must apply what they had learned while they were in the desert. That God would provide them what they needed when they were in the desert. God had promised them a land to give to them and he has brought them there to it. You see, God will give us the manna that we need when we are in the desert. When we are going through these trials and tribulations, he gives us manna. Right? If we will only take it and not grumble about the things that are going on. God will do it by his supernatural provisions. 
when we're in the promised land, he expects us to apply the laws of his words in the sowing and the reaping thereof. God says, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. I promise to do that. We must stand on those promises. We must claim those promises. I am not preaching prosperity gospel by name it, claim it, grab it, and take it, right? No, that's not what I'm saying. Or blab it and grab it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, we are to apply the principles that God has laid out for us. That is, we're to take the words of God and we're to be obedient unto them. Applying them to our lives. No grumbling, no fussing, no woe is being attitude. Oh, how easy it is to get that way. I was kind of grumpy yesterday until I came up here to the office to sit and work for a while. And by the time I got done, I was happy again. Why? Because I was in the presence of my Lord. God's supernatural provision stopped. Why? Because he is asking us to draw closer to him and to trust him and to believe in him and to become more Christ-like. He wants us to leave Egypt. He wants us to cross the sea. He wants us to wade out into the waters of Jordan in faith and see him once again part the waters. Not only long enough for Israel to cross over into the promised land, but long enough that the waters held back that they put 12 stone memorial right in the middle of the waterbed or the riverbed. God stops it to mature Israel. It's like weaning a calf or a child even. It's time for them to stop being supplied everything. It's teaching them how to do things in his own words and his strength. The manna stops for another reason, and I think it's a great reason. It prevents spiritual complacency. When God gives you everything you need, pretty soon you don't even, he's, God's going to give it to you, God's going to give it to you, God's going to give it to you. And we just actually get more sinful when we do that. Instead of being grateful for what he's given us, we just come to expect it now. Yes, there's a difference in, in you can expect things the right way and you can expect things the wrong way. I, when I expect that God's going to do something in, this life, in my life, it's because I trust what he said. I'm not expecting it because I deserve it. Because if we got what we deserved, none of us would be here. So when did this stop? It stopped when they got to the promised land. God had stopped them, sustained them through the promised land. He had provided everything they needed. But the question is, if God was providing them everything they needed, they were in the promised land, do you think that they would have marched forward to Jericho? Do you think they would have went further? No, they would have been satisfied right where they were at. God wanted them to draw on his promises to them. And that was that he was going to give them the promised land. He was going to help them. He wanted them to act in faith. He wanted them to march forward. He wanted them to rout out their enemies and claim the promised land. And guess where the food's going to be? 